Welcome to our community. Susie Thomas with you this morning. You know, every once in a while, we bring in somebody that is just an amazing person living in our community. And today's no exception. We welcome Renee Powell from the LPGA. Good morning. Good morning, Susie. It's great to be here with you. You are the pro at Clearview Golf Course, which has an amazing history. It does. Um, It's been there a long time. It's been there 71 years. Uh, The most amazing part of it is that my father designed and built it back in 1946. And it is the only golf course anywhere in the world to be designed, built, and owned and operated by an African-American. Let's talk about your dad. Okay, uh, let's go back. First of all, this is a, a fellow who just loved golf, right? He, he did. Where did he first learn to play golf? Well, he is. Uh, he was from Minerva, Ohio, which is just 10 miles down the road from the golf course, which is in East Canton. And uh, he and a young friend decided to take a little walk. And they walked and walked and walked. He was nine years old, and his friend was nine. And they came upon this course that, that was being built down not far from uh, Minerva. And I think he was so fascinated by the fact that here was a, uh, he was watching people and people hit using sticks and balls and hitting, uh, hitting these balls with these sticks. And it looked like they were trying to lose them and they were walking and not running to find them to hit them again. And, you know, youngsters at the age of nine, they run everywhere. And so he was so fascinated by this. He'd never seen it before. And the ball would go high into the air and would go a long ways. And he decided that he, uh, he wanted to try it. And so he ended up, actually, he he said by the time he got home, his mother was looking for him because she had no idea where he was, and it was dark. Oh, my. And he said, it was funny, he says, he got the worst looking he ever received, but he said... But he knew that it didn't, he didn't mind it because he knew that it was something that he, it was worth it and he wanted to to do it again. And so uh, he began playing golf and caddying at the age of nine. So caddying to earn money, Mm -hmm. extra money that he gave to his his mother and playing golf because it was such a fascinating sport. Was he self-taught? Who taught him? He was. He was self-taught. But he, he said that he would watch the better golfers play and if you were a good caddy the better players wanted to take you Mm. and uh and just like the old-time golfers like sam steed and ben hogan and and um all of the golfers in that era they were all self-taught and that's how they grew up by watching the better amateur golfers play and he played in college right on a golf scholarship he did no well they didn't have a golf scholarship at the time but he actually he and his older brother or his middle brother started the very first high school golf team they ever had at minerva high school and then uh he went on to wilberforce university which is the oldest historically black college Mm -hmm. and he and his brother started the first golf team there and ironically the very first golf match played between a historically black college and a white college in the United States. They were part of that team, and it was Wilberforce in Ohio Northern back in 1937. Who won? And Wilberforce won, (laughs) and they had a rematch, and they won again. And then actually my dad was telling me about this 65 years later, and we had a rematch of it in at Clearview. The same players? The, well, not the same players. Oh, but the two colleges. But the two colleges mm-hmm. because it, my dad was the only one living mm-hmm. on Wilberforce's team. Mm-hmm. And we found one gentleman who was still living on Ohio Northerns. And they both, he came up and they hit the first balls off the tee. Sort of like Augusta and yes. the Masters. And, Very cool. And, uh, yeah, it was really nice. But it was 65 years later. Yes. At Clearview. At Clearview. Time. Yeah. Okay. So... Then your father, and thank you so much for his service, served in World War II. Yes, he did. Can you talk about what you know of that period? In well, life? you know, after um, after high school, he really wasn't welcome in area at, to the area courses here in our area because of the color of his skin. And he, in high school, he had he had scheduled all the matches, you know, and as a team, he was able to play. But as an individual, afterwards, he wasn't. Did people realize that he was that same person? From Wilberforce, who had organized all those, uh, well, this was even started from, and started the golf team at Minerva, which would be white and black students. R- well, yeah, and actually at Minerva, their family was the only black family in the in the town, uh, and so 
but and they he were played on Minerva's and team. everybody knew him. But he would be somewhat of a local hero, right? Well, he would be. However, his skin was not white. So that is so difficult to get our minds wrapped around. It is, but it was for real. Mm-hmm. And so, um, uh, when he to fast forward, when he went to World War II, he actually went to Scotland and England. And I would say that if you are a person who loves golf, Scotland is the home of golf, oh my, yes. where, where golf started. And so he was there for, uh, what, three years, I believe. And he then um, was able, on the off days, the the Brits and the Scots would ask him if he wanted to play golf. They found that he was a golfer. He was able to use their golf clubs and play at the courses. You know, the members would allow him to. And they realized he was such a good player. And they were saying, well, are you going to, to go back when you go back to the States? Are you going to turn professional? Mm -hmm. And he, at that time, actually the PGA of America had a Caucasian-only clause until 1961. And so uh, if you were not white, you could not belong to that association and organization. So um, uh, when he came back, so he played golf in Scotland and England on those, you know, rare days off, I guess. And when he came back to the States, he felt, he really felt that things would have changed because here he was fighting for his country in a foreign country, yes. coming back as a veteran of World War II and then found out that he was still, as a black man, still treated as a second-class citizen. That, again, is so unfathomable, and thank goodness it is, but mm-hmm. that's unfathomable that someone who is... A veteran who we should do nothing but honor, mm, and true. and we are never done thanking them no, when they not. come home. That he would not be able to to play the sport that he loved You're so right. much. So so what he did was he thought it was so uh, despicable yes. that he decided that he would find some way somehow with no money to build a golf course that would allow everyone, whether it was women or whether it was somebody with red hair or blue eyes or regardless the color of your skin, to have the opportunity to play a game that was a clean sport and and a game that he loved. It would be so easy for someone who had experienced what he'd experienced to say, well, okay, then I will build a black-only golf course. Well, it was because my father did not believe in segregation. And he believed in inclusiveness, and that's the reason he would not uh, would not build something that was just one sided, because he felt that everyone should have the same opportunity. I love that. I love mm-hmm. that. That's that was his heart, mm-hmm. not just um, as a knee jerk reaction to what he was experiencing. No, absolutely not. But that he opened it to all. Correct. And his my favorite saying: the only color that matters is the color of the greens. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So let's go to, he did see at the age of nine, a golf course being built. So mm-hmm. he kind of had seen how that worked. But there he was with his dream. Now, what year was this again, please? Well, he actually did not uh, decide to build a golf course until he came back from World War II yes. because of denial. So that it goes back, he began building it in 19. 19- 1946. And when were you born? Uh, may I ask? <laughs> may, uh, may I ask I, if you were around when he was building this? I was somewhere around. Yes, in, in a, yeah, in an ish, yeah. decade-ish. No, I was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so I, I uh, obviously didn't help to build a golf no. course. But, <laughs> but I grew up and, and started playing the game when I was three. So I've been playing the game for a long time. Do you remember seeing your, and your mom helped him, right? Yeah, my my mom. Had, well, my mom, my mom didn't work outside on the golf course, mm-hmm. but my dad built the golf course almost solely on his own because he was just so determined to put justice back into where where there was injustice. Where did he find the land, and how did he acquire the land, and? Well, How do you go about building a golf course? I know. I mean, I just still can't comprehend it. But he was from Minerva. My mom was from Canton. And so they would go back and forth, you know, and, and especially in those earlier days when he was courting my mom and he, he knew the, the land. Um, 
And so when he came back, he was just looking for something because it was on the Lincoln Highway, mm -hmm. which was at the time the only coast to coast highway in the country. It went from it goes from uh, New York City to San Francisco. And so he said, you know, when you people think about, you know, uh, where things should be. And he said, well, it's the only coast to coast highway. And so he put it found he was looking for land on Brilliant. the Lincoln Highway yes, and finally found land and. Uh, but he didn't have the money, mm -hmm. so he actually taught two black doctors to play the game. So he was pretty creative, mm -hmm. and they each put in a third to buy the first 78 acres of land, of which became the first nine holes of golf. Mm -hmm. My dad didn't have his money, so his brother, who he was very close to, his brothers remained in the military, and so he... Um, he mortgaged his house. He was in California. Mortgaged his house to give my dad his portion of the money. Wow. But, boy, those brilliant investors back then, I mean, that, that certainly, I'm sure, paid off in more ways than one for them. Well, you, you know, road. they so they, they he taught them, and then he eventually uh, bought them out. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, uh, and, you know, when he was growing up, he learned. He said he, he was always like a sponge and always wanted to learn you know, as much as he can learn. My dad was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, as a youngster, worked at the golf course that was that they were building because they were still building it in the Minerva area. Some holes were in, but he watched everything and learned how to do so much and would ask questions. And um, they, you know, there weren't a lot of books at the time. And but Where do you find how to build a golf course but, but just by watching yes. and learning from people that were doing it at the time yes and asking questions so do you recall seeing this happen where do you have memories of him going out and building and and when did he do it because he had a full-time job he yes. did he, he did he had a full-time job and and uh see so he he worked for the you know t the I think he went to work at that time from 3 o'clock until late. And then the rest of the day when he would come home, mm. he would work the golf course. Well, I watched him actually when he, a little bit when he was putting the second nine holes, which was in mm -hmm. 1978. Yes. But then again, I wasn't here that much right? because I was traveling you and, been... and playing on the LPJ Tour at the yes. time. Yes. So how, okay, what tools did he use? How do you walk around and you might have in your mind how something should look, mm -hmm. but a golf course is pretty intricate. How the it holes is. match up and so forth, and then the different lengths of grass. You're right. Well, you know, it's it's, it's like an artist, and and you really mm -hmm. are. I mean, you're designing, and and knowing where, and, and he had this tremendous love of the game. He played courses in Scotland, in England, and you know there was so much of the natural element there. So he did not have equipment to move, to move earth. Right. <laughs> you know so. He walked to use the terrain of of the golf course of the land that he found to to build the golf course, and he actually had a little hand seater, which he uh, that he you know put around his neck, and you just turn it and it spreads the seed, and he walked back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, which is how he seeded the entire first nine holes of that it's golf course. Incredible! I mean, it's it's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, 1946, you say, mm -hmm. is when he started. How long did it take him then? To he actually this? opened it officially in the spring of 1948. So he started in the fall of 46, which is amazing because that, that's, people, people when they have it, big earth, earth moving equipment, all the yes. equipment, don't even get it completed in that amount of time. Exactly. But he just worked every spare moment to do this because he was so driven to do it. Yes. You know, I think of landscaping projects that take... Much longer than yeah. that, you yes. know, much smaller yeah. amount of space. But he built a nine-hole golf course by hand. I don't by think we can say that too many times. No, no, that's miraculous. I mean, he seeded it all by hand. But he he had a jeep, and he he purchased an army jeep, which we just recently had restored. Wow. An army jeep, and then he had uh, their moors. They're called gang moors. They're like they were like five units. And they mow, you know, the fairways. But he said he borrowed, uh, would borrow tractors from uh, the farmers, local farmers, when they would get their field in. But he had to wait, wait on their timing to do mm -hmm. things. Sure. And a couple of them sort of helped to plow up. And then he said he, he thought he could, he always said he thought he could get a rock picker. Because, you know, when you're looking at land, you're having to pick a lot of 
you know, rocks and yes. stones up. And he said, but he ended up being the rock picker. Oh, okay. uh, and uh, because, you know, when you're swinging and using, you know, golf equipment, you don't want to be hitting stones and rocks. And so there was a lot to it. And so it's just an amazing story. It's an amazing story. It, it is. It needs to be a movie. It does need to be a movie. Who would you pick to play your father? I don't know. Maybe I don't know. And I, it would depend what age, at what you're year. Right. At different different ages, mm-hmm. you know, probably at a later age, probably somebody like a Morgan Freeman, oh. somebody uh, like a Denzel Washington earlier on, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm on the same wavelength <laughs> with you. I would have thrown Danny Glover in there at some oh, point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, True. Right, we do need to take a break. <laughs> we'll be back after these words. You're listening to Our Community.